we have about 70 years of psychology and media effects research that talks about the ways in which media content actually shapes our political perceptions and changes public opinion. My question is, do most audiences know that? We have you here today to talk about your work, you know, and what you do, describe this work and how you came to it. The beautiful part of my experience is that I was raised by activists, right? I was raised by activist educators who actually kind of got me involved on the front lines of a number of human rights issues that were happening in our particular context. I grew up in South Florida. So when Haitian refugees were being excluded and completely ostracized in our immigration process, while other immigrants who had more pale complexions were not, what we had a chance to do when I was like 16 was to actually work with folks on the ground to ad address the issues. So I grew up in this. The idea being from my father's perspective um, as a pastor that our duty is to actually provide for those who are most vulnerable in this society. The idea behind that, of course, being a scriptural reference that, you know, what we do for the least of these, we do unto God and um, unto Christ. And so what I look at in my work is how do I place those who are most marginalized, who are most vulnerable at the center of my work, and then what does that look like, right? If I place the most marginal, if you place the most marginalized people in the center of your work, what does it do? Well, for me, it required that when I was coming out of law school that I did not go and get a six-figure job. It required for me to go to the Southern Center for Human Rights and actually work on the cases of those who are incarcerated and living under slavery in the United States as a result of that incarceration. Initially, I thought I wanted to go into litigation. I got there honestly with those wonderful lawyers at the Southern Center for Human Rights and I saw them putting in 80 hour weeks regularly and making 33, maybe $37,000 a year. I realized very quickly that my socioeconomic background did not provide the privilege of me choosing that career. Um, it is a privilege. And that's the part that we have to recognize is that a lot of this work is terribly underfunded and under-resourced. I really am focusing on what's happening for the most marginalized in any context, but typically that always seems to come back to women and girls who look like me. And that is where the passion kicks in. And so I've taken human rights law and I have tried to make it popular education. I've tried to with the National Center for Human Rights Education, which is one of my first stops. As the executive director there, I was able to really kind of pull together human rights organizations on the ground here, right? That, that folks are actually concerned about human rights abuses in the United States. And ultimately, um, to put some opportunities and resources behind these wonderful women who had been doing human rights organizing in the South for I don't know how many decades. What movies teach about race, exceptionalism, erasure, and entitlement was an outgrowth of some research that I did. I honestly walked in with a hypothesis that I was not able to prove, but the things that I learned blew me away. It was so much more than I could have ever dreamed. I was able to find 10 of the top 20 films of all times, the ones that have been watched by the most viewers, eyes on film, right? All over the world. Now, at the time of my study, those top 10 films included like four versions of Star Wars and Avatar and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And those of you who know those films know exactly where I'm going with this. The bottom line is, is that 
what I was able to do was to show using multiple disciplines and multiple approaches, right? So we use qualitative research methods. We did some quantitative frequencies. We also did a critical theory analysis and engaged in a number of things to just figure out what's going on. Well, these 10 films are on the Library of Congress's list of these most culturally and historically significant films. So they're in the sample in itself kind of validated itself. Then what we were able to do was to actually sit some coders down and have them go through, pick out what, what did you see? Tell us, talk about what we saw and what we were able to do almost um, in a way that, that really silenced the room was to nail the same concepts each and every time. Raping and pillaging of entire countries by white men with impunity. But when the marginalized groups, black and brown folks did the same things in those films, they had to be annihilated. If they were not annihilated, they were castigated and punished locked up often incarcerated and thrown away as though they were worth nothing this is a public pedagogy this is what it means to teach an entire society about the ranking and relationships of the different types of groups and people that exist in that society we have about 70 years of psychology and media effects research that talks about the ways in which media content actually shapes our political perceptions and changes public opinion my question is do most audiences know that the, those things that are in the movies the people who make them do they know that they're in there oh not always yeah. you know I, I this is one of the things i bring out in the book motive is always hard to get to even at a court of law trying to get to motive is is always a slippery slope which is why it's amazing that the killers of Ahmaud Arbery were actually convicted of hate crimes, right? Because the hate crimes law actually requires that you prove intent, you right. prove motive. And proving motive with a filmmaker, come on, really, can we really do that? No, because it's a whole bunch of folks that go into making these movies. And if the studio executives that I worked with at TriStar back in the day went to one of the writers and said, hey, we're just not feeling this character. Can you shape it this way? Can you do this? Maybe we should cast so-and-so as this character and this other person as this character. Those were decisions that really weren't options for the filmmaker, not the right. writer, not the director necessarily, but influences so there's a whole system at work and we've got to address what's happening in the whole system this kind of gets to my dream right my dream is to have a, a army of consultants who are on the sets of every mm -hmm. film helping with kind of historical revisionism helping to avoid historical revisionism helping to um actually tell the story in ways that really help us to understand the context a little bit better than this simple um messages that we get in this decontextualized content that we see you know war films are an exact reflection of the time that they're made right so if you watch you know john wayne john wayne you know saves the day if you if you watch an oliver stone movie the head of the platoon is actually trying to betray his his own men you know mm -hmm. so is there something that can be inferred a subconscious element that's in all these movies that just hasn't been you know it's been made a cliche that that has to be untangled? Oh, absolutely. They're the stereotypes, right? So the stereotypes actually function as shortcuts. They actually allow for filmmakers. And I, you know, I remember my days as a film production major back at Howard University in Washington, DC, trying to figure out how do we get all of this story we want to tell into 12 minutes, right? How do we, how do we do it? Well, we use a bunch of shortcuts and we tend to, in those shortcuts, employ a lot of stereotypes. And that's the danger, right? Because the stereotypes have a history and often um, I'm, I'm finding that writers and directors are not necessarily focusing on that history. They're using what they know. They're using what they've been taught to use. This, of course, gets back into the pedagogy in higher education and film schools, but 
we are really looking at a, a, a larger problem about culture and storytelling, right? Whose version of the story do we believe? How, whose version of the story is given the highest level of veracity in this social context? How is it that my child can watch certain content and not be affected at all by the fact that all of the, the characters are, all the characters who are evil and bad are dressed in black or actually colored black? That my child, I have to teach him to decode that content and to actually reject that content. It's a difficult thing because I don't know that intent or motive are really where we should focus our, our, our questions or our interests. I think the, the really important thing that the Supreme Court has passed down to us in the equal protection cases is that disproportionate impact can be just as detrimental and harmful and culpable as disproportionate intent. Are we getting, is there any inkling? Are we seeing any changes from the top where we're seeing filmmakers coming out, you know, that are female, that are black, that are coming from these margins? Is there anything happening right now? Are you seeing anything happening in this, in this culture we have right now, of, you know, pressure? Is there real pressure? Is there accountability? What I do think is happening is pressure, right? Pressure, pressure is happening the end of my book is all a call to action it's all about active audiences taking their power back and pushing back against these images instead of just changing the channel or changing the medium let's actually give folks hell when they give us hell many groups have been very uh successful i like to highlight the um, live action mulan um, and the response of Chinese American audiences who said, you will no longer mistell our stories and misconstrue our culture. We will push back and you will not cast all white actors for characters that are Chinese. And we were able to watch in this tremendous movement, this uprising of everyday ordinary people saying it's not right. And allies joining in and whether they were black or brown or purple, they were standing up and saying, we're tired of Hollywood whitewashing these narratives. And what we saw was a, a pretty good correction. Um, I think, I think from what it would have been, um, from what the original plan was, but we've really got to do this, I think, large uh, in a more large and systemic way. I, I'm working with a great organization in Los Angeles called Positive Impact. And um, one of the things that Kelly's been able to do with Positive Impact is to pull together black and brown communities to push back against the filmmaking industry when there are negative representations. What I'm helping her to do is to think about how do we get in on the front side of that? How do we get in and help correct the problem before it happens? Um, it's one thing to push back after a film's been done, but there's really not much the filmmakers or anybody else can do about it at that point. I want to see whether, you know, this idea that I used to just always quote, it was a Maya Angelou quote about people do better when they know better. And I, I early on in my career, as I mentioned earlier in this interview, stop believing that. I'm kind of willing to try again. I'm willing to get out there and have some conversations. I just talked, I talked to the president of Lionsgate before I left California um, and just put the idea in his head. Hey, look, I'm here and I can help you guys with some of these films, but you've got to actually want to do better. And that's the issue. Do we have the willingness? Do the studio um, heads and do the filmmakers actually have the openness to have those conversations? The mic that I've been handed uh, allows me to to say it differently to a different audience. And I'm convicted 
to do that. Uh, but I don't know. I, I, I wish so very much that folks would just open themselves to the possibility that there's a new thought, right? That, there, that, that we don't have it all figured out and that there are a lot of people out here who have answers. I'm now working at the Ray Dow Institute for Social Equity at Kennesaw State University. It was a conscious decision. It was a sacrifice on my part, but I chose to do it so that I could focus on the solutions and not just the problems, right? I've been studying my entire career, the problems. I, I'm, I'm, I think we're all saturated with the problems. What can we do to dream a world, uh, the world that we want to have, the world that we could have had, right? Professor Derek Bell, a uh, Harvard law professor, um, back in the 80s wrote, uh, to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be, right? It's the might be part that I think we don't allow ourselves to dream we just take in a lot of content and I'm encouraging folks to stop taking in content and actually start creating content. Let's actually think about what we want to see and let's make that. Let's think about what we want to create. If we want social equity, right? If we want fairness mm -hmm. socially, if, and that's all social equity is, right? We have yeah. courts of equity, we have courts of law, Equity is really just about if we want to have a fair society, then what do we have to do? Let's dream what life would have been like without slavery. Let's think about what life would have been like without Jim Crow segregation, without the 13th Amendment. What would life be like if felons could vote? You know, what, what would life be like if everybody's vote counted? What's also really important for everyone who's watching this, you know, you say, like, make the stories that you want to you know, be bold. There is a lot of work to do. There is no doubt. We, there is no rest, right? There's no rest here. But I think what I'm taking from you, even though we have to acknowledge all of what has happened and how we built this place, but there are things that we can do to, you know, open up the stories that we're telling. And so that is what we take. I'm having you here. We're so grateful. Yeah, to you. yeah thank you. Talk with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Really wonderful.